Hi all, I have an absolutely classic encounter to show you today between two absolute legends of the game, Boris Spassky playing white against Svetozar Gligorich. This was played in 1980. So let's have a look at this game. e4 from Boris Spassky, e5, knight c3, knight f6. And although the most common move uh, is usually f4 here, which I thought was more justified by knight f6 as opposed to knight c6, because against knight c6, black might be able to just take this pawn and even support it later with g5. But against knight f6, there's an assumption that usually white's interested in playing f4. Boris Spassky plays it a slightly different way, g3. And this is more in the style of a king's engine attack. Uh, with f4, black is has fought to get a, a really a really quite quite a nice game with d5. So for example, f takes, knight takes e4. And there's one or two uh, key moves here. Uh, d3, for example, black could play knight takes and d4. And this is well-known uh, theory. And black's thought to be fine, actually, in this line. Uh, so white can sometimes get a slightly passive position. Black's holding on to that pawn on c3. It's interesting. And there's also queen f3. Slightly more novel, perhaps. But again, uh, this territory doesn't seem to offer too many big problems, uh, usually for black, this kind of territory. So the way Boris Spassky plays it with g3 is kind of quieter, but maybe more stable, not involving any major risks on this diagonal, it seems. We have bishop c5, bishop g2, knight c6, d3, d6. And here... The bishop is prone uh, to being attacked and white goes for it with knight a4. There's no escape route back for the bishop. If check, then c for him b4. So black actually plays bishop g4. And here, in fact, Boris plays f3. So both bishops attacked. And Gligorich plays now bishop takes g1. So which bishop to take here? Here is an instructive, an instructive point in the game. Do you allow yourself doubled pawns or do you take this bishop on g1? Uh, so what would be your decision here if I give you five seconds if you want to uh, make a, the considerations for the up and down sides here? White play. Okay, well, Boris chose actually f takes. He didn't mind the double pawns. He's seeing that maybe this bishop has got some opportunities later, for example, on this diagonal at some point with with some preparation. And this bishop is also going to be grabbed as well. So white's actually going to get both bishops out of this. If white had played rook takes, black could play bishop d7, preserving the light square bishop. And this might lead white to a small edge, but it's not that convincing. As the game continuation, it seems actually kind of more ambitious to try and get both bishops from black here. So bishop c5. Uh, no, bishop b6 is also to be considered, but maybe white just takes, and then this is quite pleasant for white. So bishop c5, knight takes c5, d takes. It seems as though black with the two knights does have an iron grip over the d4 square at the moment. We have g5, knight d7, bishop e3, queen e7 and white castles knight f8 if black had castled routinely here then maybe queen h5 is is quite dangerous for example this position uh, where white can play for bishop h3 and get a nice kind of position like this where yeah white's bishop pair and the potential pressure on the center this this looks pretty nice for white so black played knight f8 we have here h4, so not only securing g5 more, but the bishop coming to h3 looks very pleasant as a diagonal here. Black plays knight e6, and it does seem as though there's an iron grip over the d4 square for sure. Bishop h3, black castles queen side, and now queen h5 looking f7, rook d f8, rook f2, white is preparing to build against f7, king b8. Rook a f1, 
And this knight goes back. Black is refusing to play g6, weakening the dark squares. So knight c d8. Black's play does seem a little bit passive at the moment. We have king h2, b6. And now, to accelerate the bishops more, the bishops really need the position to open up more. But black does have this bind over the d4 square. If only this can be loosened. Boris Baski's next quiet move is instructive a3 to undermine with b4 even at the cost of a pawn this will be very very interesting potentially a5 c3 preparing b4 again queen d6 and that hits d3 this is now protected by the queen coming back to d1 and it's not easy for black to immediately put more pressure on d3 here this there's congestion rook e8 now b4 and the queen is actually well prepared for an interesting idea of queen a1 sometimes, which would go along that a file and hit e5. We have a takes b, a takes, c takes b4, c takes b4, so offering a pawn here. Black ignores that pawn with knight d4. If it was taken, then this nifty looking move queen a1. And there's also ideas of rook a2. This seems very, very dangerous on the a file as well. Uh, say queen b5, rook a2, then queen c6, queen takes e5 is very, very pleasant indeed for white. White will be getting an enormous advantage here, a winning advantage in fact, because there's tactics like this with bishop takes e6 and queen a2 check hitting uh, the rook as well. So there's nasty tactics installed for black uh, on taking on b4. It seems so that was ignored knight d4 we have rook a2 this seems very very dangerous indeed in fact this bishop is covering a key escape square so the mating that is being woven around the black king here with the a file now being uh, a major concern we have queen c6 being played on queen takes b4 here just to look at the wrath of queen a1 uh, for example rook a8 check and rook c1 covers the black king's escape c6 and if black's best is that then that's not particularly good but if black doesn't do anything black's just getting mated here for example queen a7 is checkmate or queen a6 is checkmate so that's absolutely no good so queen c6 a defensive try but now this nice knight is taken off that's black's only uh, adventurous piece in white's position and this means actually potentially this diagonal is also a major thing for this bishop to return to uh, queen a1 white is in no hurry for that though queen a1 rook e7 uh, the bishop still covering a key escape square while it's on while it's on h3 anyway rook a7 so we have an idea here of queen a6 and also potentially uh, that leverage is Queen c8 and maybe even sacking the rook for rook a1 mating. So this is extremely dangerous here. We have check. What else? If knight e6, then queen a6, for example. And this possession, if the knight has to go back, well, that's that's the end of game. Uh, that Those sort of mechanics are available. So check, it's uh, not a very pleasant position at all. Black is really kind of busted here. Uh, too many pieces are encroaching on the black king. Queen takes d3. We have rook c1, sealing exit squares in advance for the black king to be mated. A move in desperation, knight c6. If queen takes e4 check, then the bishop gets that fine diagonal looking at a8. Uh, so that would be absolutely hopeless. If queen moves, rook a8 is checkmate. So uh, knight c6, pardon me, knight c6 was played. After check, it's all hopeless. Rook, rook takes h8, winning a rook. And after this, can you see the final move? If I give you five seconds. Okay, the common square. Bishop c8 is checkmate, that common square of rook and bishop. So a very convincing game in the King's Engine attack style, playing the Vienna in that way. Uh, avoiding the lines where black plays d5. So very, very interesting. Uh, there's a free short and sweet course at Chasuble at the moment. You may want to check out the core variations which are trainable absolutely for free from a very strong Grandmaster. King's Crusher TV 
slash Vienna if you want to check that out. Uh, well worth checking out to equip you, equip you if you want to play the Vienna game. Okay, and there's very very interesting recommendations like this, which uh, choose quality versus what might be more popular. So the Spassky way does seem a very solid way of approaching uh, the opening as this game shows. Okay, thanks very much.